Hello and today, and as promised, we have something pretty special and original to share with you. So first of all, it's not because we're Swiss that we want to focus exclusively on Swiss watchmaking, but I think you guessed that. And what matters is the creative and qualitative approach watchmakers have. I mean, of course, we are very privileged here in Switzerland to have an exceptional uh, concentration of talents, brands and know-how, something that luckily has been preserved and cherished uh, when other watchmaking industry have fallen into demise over the course of history. But I must say that today I am witnessing quite a lot of exciting endeavors from great individuals all over the world, something very cool, exciting and promising. So we're now heading to Moscow to meet Konstantin Chekin, a guy you have uh, seen in, uh, in some of our Basel World videos, someone who's really brought something uh, fresh uh, on the watchmaking scene and has recently been awarded for it at the 2018 GPHG with a special and well-deserved Audacity Prize. So he first greeted me on the Red Square of Moscow, we chatted about some of the clocks found in the Kremlin, and visited together an important museum just next to it with some very interesting timepieces, and he explained uh, to me a bit of the history of Russian watchmaking, which was actually mainly relying on Western know-how from France, Germany, England, and naturally Switzerland back in the 18th and 19th century. But during the Soviet era, there used to be a strong Russian watchmaking industry, producing millions of watches per year, and many, mainly selling those in Soviet-influenced uh, countries. But after the fall of the Soviet Union in the, in the early 1990s, well, this entire industry just totally collapsed, and there are now only a few projects that try to relaunch this. I mean, the main names you might have heard of are Rakita and Stromansky, among a few seldom others. But Konstantin Chaking's route is quite different, and this is what we will concentrate on with a full visit of his Moscow workshop and discover together his main timepieces. And I will also tell you a bit more on the watch that I'm currently wearing. But before diving into this, I just wanted to add something uh, which has always impressed me with Russians. It's their resourcefulness. And what I mean by this is that basically you give a Russian a piece of wood, a hairdryer, some gaffer tape and an old radio and the guy would build you some kind of space rocket. Okay, I might be a bit exaggerating, but there is a bit of that uh, when you go through Konstantin Chaking's operation. So we are quite used to see some fancy facilities with serious and expensive machines, uh, everything super well organized, super tidy, state of the art, etc. Well, here things are a little bit different, but in no way it undermines what Chaking has achieved on the contrary, I really loved it and I really think it is interesting to know a bit more about the man because his history uh, reflects pretty well what I've just said. So to start up with, and despite being a super creative watchmaker, well, Konstantin Chaking is no watchmaker. Okay, I mean by training, because over the last few years he for sure has proven to be a very talented watchmaker. So as a kid, he did like uh, taking apart uh, clocks, like many of us, but apart from that, not much interest in it. He preferred electronics and radio communication in particular. In 1996, he found his way of communicating with the world with longwave radios, and that was a real eye-opener for the man who pursued this interest and went on to study radio communication. So by 1994, he completed his university studies and then had to go to the army for a couple of years. And when he came back, well, Russia had seriously changed. In 2000, he started to show an interest on the business side of watchmaking, buying and selling rather cheap watches in Russia. And uh, by being closer to watches, well, his interest really grew and he really liked the small dimensions and sizes, the intricacies implied with mechanical watchmaking. So he started to study on his own, re uh, reading tons of books, and uh, basically this is how he really got into it. I mean, his library uh, being his watchmaking school. So he then got to perform some restoration work, and this naturally helped him get seriously acquainted with the art of watchmaking. So with a bit of hands-on experience, a bit of theory from his reading, he then immediately set himself a pretty massive challenge and started to work on a very complicated module. Well, I mean, he definitely uh, chose not to start the easy way, as he developed a module which calculates the precise orthodox Easter date, something super, super complicated to do, and any watchmaker will, uh, will tell you so. 
So this was back in 2005 and uh, he filed a patent for it and since then has filed no less than 70 patents. Yes, I told you the guy is creative. By 2007, he had produced four clocks and during that year, a customer of his commissioned him for his first complicated clock, a job that he presented in 2008 to the AHCI, that's the Independent Watchmaker Association. And that's how he got accepted into this group of very respected watchmakers, including such prestigious names as Philippe Dufour, François Paul Joux, Anne Vianney Alter, Andreas Treller, to name only a few. So being now a member of this HCI, this enabled him in 2009 to present his work at Baselworld, since the association has a booth there, and personally, uh, this is how I met him. So by 2010, he finally sold his first watch with his own movement, and everything seemed to develop pretty nicely for him from that point on. So today, Konstantin Chekin produces approximately 150 timepieces per year, compared to only 10 in 2013, 20 in 2014. But in 2017, the Joker watch uh, changed everything as this really fun watch got him an immense visibility. Personally, I really love it and it just proves that with some creativity and again some resourcefulness, you can still come up with a very original, different and playful product. So coming back on his operation, well, this is quite something. He is located just outside of Moscow Center, quite a different setting than the ones we're used to, and he has a team of approximately 20 people around him. So like any watchmaker, he has a technical office where he, uh, they develop their new timepieces, working on prototypes and testing things. They naturally have manufacturing capabilities with uh, machines that sometimes are a bit customized, but still does the job right. An assembly workshop with quality control and so forth, well, they, are re they really try to do as much as possible internally, but they still have to rely on some outside components and even movements. So for instance, regarding the, the Joker watch, the base movement is an ETA 2824, but he then added a custom made module made out of 61 components, which animates uh, the eyes, respectively the hour and minute subdials, and the mouth and its uh, moon phase indicator. So part of his operation is found in an adjacent building, also quite an adventure to get there with very practical steel beams in the middle of the main corridor. Can't imagine the number of bruise heads uh, these uh, can account for. And this is where they will take care of dial painting and printing. As I said, as much as possible internal. But something important for Chaikin, and I can only respect this, is that he really knows and feels about the importance of uh, knowledge sharing and transmission. Since many years, you don't have any dedicated watchmaking schools in Russia, and it is therefore complicated to find skilled people. So he decided to develop his own school and use as part of his facility to train people. Okay, but now let's listen to Konstantin, who will present some of his main timepieces developed in the recent years, not mentioning the special one I am wearing now, but I will get back to this in a moment. Часы uh, time, они были показаны, да, в 2013 году. Это часы в достаточно классическом дизайне, вот, но тем не менее у них есть функция уникальная, да, функция, которой нет других часов. Они э, как бы рассказывают, показывают время в формате э, русской лингвистической традиции. То есть они дел, делят время на четыре части. Утро, день, вечер и ночь. Часовая стрелка здесь делает один оборот не за 12 часов, как обыкновенные в часах, да, а за 6 часов. И, соответственно, за сутки часовая стрелка делает полные четыре оборота в сутки. Часы, кстати, небольшие. Корпус 40 мм. Вот, выполнен на нашем мануфактурном механизме. Вот. Корпус и золото, стрелки, соответственно, тоже это золото. Окей, okay, first originality with this one, but let's continue. Это часы луноход. Называется луноход. Луноход в переводе с... Э, э, переводе на английский язык Monrover, да, то есть... И часы полностью посвящены достижениям советской космонавтики. Вот, да, то есть они имеют совершенно необычный футуристичный дизайн. Вот. Ну и уникальность у них, как бы, там несколько уникальных моментов, да, про которые хочешь сказать. Они имеют всего лишь там три функции. Это часы, минуты и по центру находится указатель фаслоны. Указатель фаслоны, эти часы мной были сделаны в 2011 году. На тот момент это были первые часы, которые имели такой необычный указатель фаслоны, где Луна находилась неподвижно, а вращалась только... Полусфер. Кроме того, на сегодняшний день это самый крупный в мире 3D-индикатор лунных фаз в этих часах. Это единственные в мире часы, в корпус, в которых выполнен из необычного материала, булата. Рисунок, который на поверхности корпуса существует, это натуральный рисунок, который находится в структуре металла. Механизм мануфактурный, 
то есть все детали изготовлены на нашем производстве. Диаметр корпуса не маленький, 50 мм, но тем не менее на руке они смотрятся достаточно органично. So quite a UFO this one, or should I say UWO for unidentified watch object. Okay, regarding the next one, well, there's quite a funny story because on the same year that the Levitas came out, Cartier presented a very similar timepiece with its mystery watch. But obviously you can't really compare the two brands and their respective development capabilities. Again, a lot of credit to Chaikin for this. Часы Levitas, они у нас существуют в двух исполнениях. Это вариант в дамском исполнении. Диаметр корпуса 40 мм, есть еще вариант исполнения в мужском 44 мм, в, в обоих часах мануфактурный механизм и э, отличается диаметром корпуса, диаметром механизма. А часы имеют э, механизм таинственной конструкции, да, то есть когда э, стрелки как бы висят в воздухе. Выполнены они по стандартной схеме, которую еще в первой половине XIX века придумал Жанна Жан Робер Руден. Да, это французский фокусник. Окей, okay, next one stands on a rather simple idea, but this is just some mighty cool mechanics. Это часы Genius Temperis, они были э, сделаны в 2015 году. То есть у них э, э, мануфактурный механизм. Это у них классический дизайн. Я вдохновился как бы этими часами, когда э, изучал старинные часы, реставрацию, старинные часовые механизмы. Корпус э, выполнен э, золотом 44 мм. Э, вот, ну и э, цифроблат, там отдельные элементы выполнены вручную. So what I really like about this watch is that you only have one hand, the hour hand, and you can more or less uh, guess the approximate time by interpreting uh, where this hand stands between the hour marker. But by pressing the, this pusher at two o'clock, it will then uh, show you the actual and precise minutes on the moon. Just simply great. Okay, the next watch is one that I placed in my top five of uh, the best watches of Basel World in 2013. Just as simple as that. <laughs> Там, как лучше же часы Базеля в 2013 году. История этих часов, она э, удивительна тем, что она рас, рассказывает об истории, в принципе, всего кинематографа. Они имеют сложный механизм, тоже мануфактурный. Э, в механизме два барабана. Один барабан для работы часов, часового механизма. Второй, второй барабан для э, работы механизма анимации. Вот. И при нажатии на кнопку сейчас можно будет увидеть маленькое механическое кино. Вот. Будет маленький фильм. И, соответственно, видим э, ту самую, те самые картинки, которые вошли в основу э, в эти there is something really magical when you look at the horse and again it may appear simple but you have emotions coming out of this object it tells a story and I like that okay next watch это часы называется деколог они как бы с иудейской индикацией у них вот этот указатель который как бы секундная стрелка он показывает хелики хелики это еврейская единица времени которая составляет 1 18 минуты Часовая минутная стрелка двигается в обратную сторону. Есть указатель фас Луны, который расположен на 6 часов. То есть видно, что он перевернутый. Да? И эти часы впервые я сделал, наверное, в 2009 или 2010 году, наручные. Эти часы и вот исполнение в виде перевернутого указателя фас Луны, который там не классический сверху, а снизу явился, неким шагом потом к следующим часам к Джокеру. Okay, well, yes, I mean, not possible to talk about Chaikin without mentioning the Joker, another of my favorite watches of Basel World, but this time that was two years ago. Там в течение года на них смотрел, 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 потом подумал, нужно уже к воображаемому Морту, который в виде указателя фаслун, добавить глаза. Таким образом, механически родился Джокер, потом он обрастал уже дизайном обрастал концепции. Yes, the Joker definitely made a pretty big impact on the watchmaking scene. I completely understand that it may not be to 
everyone's liking, but one has to acknowledge that this is a perfect example of how creativity can bring something different to the table. It's fresh, it's inventive, and on a personal note, well, I seriously regret, uh, regret not having bought one when it came out. Okay, still talking about creativity and demonstrating yet again that constantly Jakey never stops. Well, he recently uh, came out with this watch. He had developed a full mechanical version, naturally a bit more complicated and of course slightly more expensive. So he came out with a quartz version and the particularity of this watch is that it shows the entire 11 time zones of Russia on the same dial. I mean, that's a big, big country. Okay, this is more of a fun watch, a reason why it is not branded as, Chaikin, uh, as a Chaikin model and instead goes by the name Putnik. But uh, just uh, wanted to show you that that man really never stopped and I can't wait to see his next move. I mean, for instance, while I was in Moscow, he showed the clock he was working on and as you can imagine, it's again pretty creative. And talking about clocks, well, uh, we didn't say much about this, but he, had, oh, he has already uh, developed some super complicated ones with some pretty impressive astronomical functions. But this is, uh, I think, uh, should be part of another dedicated report. So the perfect excuse for me to go back to Moscow. So all the very best to you. Hope you enjoyed this different take on watchmaking and see you real soon. Till then, viva watchmaking! <laughs>